Today on Missing Link. What is it that connects clothing and money? Where's the connection between money and butterflies? What do the colorful pollinators have to do with aircraft navigation? And the link between aerial navigation and the northern lights? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link. Clothing donations should be sent to where they're most needed. One sure way is to put them in a container run by a well-known aid organization. Another way is to deliver them personally to the clothes banks or second-hand shops run by these organizations. The collection centers then decide which items will be sold on to raise money for charity. It's important to check the name of the organization doing street collections. Is it being run by a charity whose name you can trust or by a private company. The clothes we donate should be clean and intact. Warm coats and shoes are particularly appreciated, as are winter clothes in general. And it doesn't matter if the donated clothes aren't the height of fashion. Clothes which are suitable for resale, designer suits and silk scarves are sold directly to the public. The German Red Cross sells donated clothes in its so-called kilo shops. The cheapest way to buy here is in the one euro department. Each item costs one euro. Clothes that are in better condition are sold by the kilo, 12 euros per kilo. Brand name items in good condition are individually priced. For example, a pair of name jeans costs 14 euros 90. The sales staff in the shops decide how the donated clothes will be distributed in the various departments according to supply and demand. The profit from the kilo shops go directly to the Red Cross. Oh, here we've got a pair of brand new jeans. They're in good condition and a good size. We use the donated clothes to raise money because we get a lot of donations from the public, but we receive more than the clothes we need. And we need money to finance other projects run by the Red Cross in Hamburg, and that's why we're doing this. The sale of second-hand clothes benefits the aid organizations, and their customers can pick up some great bargains. Though the range of goods offered by clothes banks and kilo shops is very broad, there are certain items which are in short supply throughout the year. There's always a shortage of children's clothes, it's quite a problem. People tend to keep them themselves or they're often in poor condition. We also lack household items like bed clothes, tablecloths and things like that. There's always a demand for items like that, especially among those with lower incomes. In Germany, the amount of donated clothes far exceeds what can be sold in charity shops. So there are two other options to recycle the goods. One is to shred the old textiles to make fleece for industrial carpets or car interiors. The other option is to sell them in Africa, but this is controversial. Economics experts claim that this trade ruins the local textile industries in African countries. Others claim that it creates new jobs and generates modest wealth. One problem for the charity organizations is when the donated clothes are not even fit for use as cleaning rags. Then it ends up costing them money. A banknote press working flat out. In these times of the Euro crisis, the central banks are facing a difficult task. But what's the connection between the printing of money and our clothing? It used to be that money was made out of gold. A gold coin really was of the value stamped on it. The introduction of paper money naturally changed all that. In the USA, banknotes were initially just that, a sort of a note from the bank that said, the United States of America will pay the bearer on demand one dollar. Sounds like a good deal. And as these slips of paper became ever more popular as a means of payment, Lots of people thought it's a good deal. And that included those of a criminal persuasion who started trying to print banknotes at home. To try to prevent this, banknotes were introduced with security features that weren't so easy to copy. And that started with the paper itself. Euro notes are not made out of ordinary paper, but from pure cotton paper. Often this cotton is gained from old clothing that has been collected as rags. 
Remember, the next time you go shopping, you could be offering payment with old underwear. The inscrutable world of banks and stock markets. René Tsaia of Switzerland has a behind-the-scenes insight into this world. As a long-time communications consultant in the financial sector, he observed how the financial markets slipped further and further into an insane cycle of speculation and what the consequences might be for us. Tsaia and his colleagues are trying to discover the laws that govern so-called speculation bubbles. He aims to decipher the DNA of the financial crisis. The current situation is a radical example of the consequences of speculation gone wild. The sheer scale of this crisis seems unparalleled, but it's no isolated incident. There are certainly two or three principles that always apply, such as the pure greed of everyone involved. In other words, everyone who speculates hoping to make an extra profit that no one else makes. But if everyone is trying to make an extra profit, the whole system breaks down. And the other thing is an ignorance of the consequences of such speculative trading. This is how financial crises, which can take on vast dimensions, happen again and again. But how can we prevent them causing a global catastrophe like the Great Depression of the 1920s? Back then, the promise of a golden future set off an avalanche of financial speculation. In order to play the stock markets, many people took out overpriced loans. As the market values dropped, masses of investors tried to sell their shares. The stock markets crashed, which signaled the start of the first global economic crisis. The patterns widely known, but our ability to learn from such events seems limited. In the world Following the Great Depression of the 1920s and 30s, the banking system drew certain necessary conclusions. But these were thrown overboard again later on. The separation, especially in the US, of so-called commercial banks and investment banks, and that is all the ones that have gone bankrupt now, was a consequence of the Great Depression of the 1920s. The distinction between commercial banks and speculative banks was introduced back then, but it was eventually thrown overboard. Sire is sure of one thing. Such wild speculation is caused by the bankers who peddle obscure, risky products to their investors. Following the same pattern, a new bubble was to form at the end of the 1990s. The Internet age had begun. Back then, thousands of financial experts started acting as if the Internet was printing money and that every silly Internet company, many of which consisted only of a website, was a secure investment and a guarantee of good returns. Das wirft meiner Meinung nach nicht unbedingt den ersten Investors, ein schlechtes Licht auf die Gier des Kleinanlegers, sondern auf die Inkompetenz des Finanzspezialisten. And financial experts push their customers into risky investments. After all, the primary aim is to maximize profits for the banks and the bankers. The investor is the last in line. Back then, an enormous amount of money was pumped into the market in order to prevent a recession. The same thing's happening today in order to increase spending. The government is speculating that it will work out at the risk of future generations. But the more state funds that are pumped in, the greater the risk that the situation will reach a tipping point. At the moment, the industrialized nations have to bail out the bankrupt banks to the tune of thousands of billions of dollars. Countries themselves can print money, but they can't produce the value that supports the money. It's likely that we'll see some countries go bankrupt by the end of the year. Sire is convinced that the next speculation will come and burst. It seems that our system provokes this boom and bust cycle. There are some components that remain stable. The investors profit seeking and the unscrupulous cunning nature of the financial sharks. In times of crisis, our governments only seem to have one standard response to pump money into the market. It seems there's no way to avoid the same old vicious cycle. There are over 180,000 species of butterfly in the world. Their brilliant colors have no parallel in the animal kingdom. But how are butterflies connected to money? 
for people, these are amongst the most loved of all insects, the colourful side of summer, butterflies. Although from a scientific aspect they aren't so colourful, indeed butterflies have few colour pigments. The glittering colours we see are the result of their wing structure interacting with sunlight. We know from rainbows that sunlight is made up of all colours. Sunlight falling on a butterfly's wings turns into all these colours. Light is reflected from the top and the bottom of the wings' fine ribs, overlapping each other. It's what we might describe as the magical shimmering of a thousand colours. But scientists call it interference patterns. This property has been adopted by banknotes too. It functions in exactly the same way and is a vital security feature for them. The shimmering numbers are made up of microscopic particles that form a structure just like a butterfly's wing. But despite their very own security markings, as far as we know, nowhere are butterflies legal tender. Gudrun Spera has realized her dream. Fifteen years ago, the former humanitarian worker and her Peruvian husband, Robler, decided to set up a butterfly farm with great success. Austrian-born Gudrun welcomes visitors every day. Tourists of every nationality drop in during their Amazon tours to admire the glorious butterflies in her aviaries. The entrance fees help Gudrun finance her passion, a breeding program for 27 butterfly species. Mir geht's um die Erhaltung der Schmetterlinge. Und dadurch, dass also sehr viele gefangen werden und andererseits species. man die Futterpflanzen Many noch nicht kennt, kommen sie in Gefahr. Dadurch, dass gleichzeitig immer mehr Urwald abgeholzt wird, dass die Futterpflanzen können, wie bei uns sagt, ja, Malayerba Unkraut sein, aber sie sind nicht die einzige Futterpflanze, wo diese Schmetterlingsart drauflegen kann. Schön wäre es halt, wenn man irgendwann, also mit Hilfe anderer Leute, alle Futterpflanzen kennen würde. The insects are raised in the breeding center. A fine mesh fly net protects them from parasites. These are about two months old. This is a species that feeds only at night. In the daytime, as we see here, they all sit together on one leaf. The right host plants are crucial to the breeding program. As soon as the tiny caterpillars have hatched, Gudrun places them on a leaf of their preferred plant. We have fast six years to find out the 43 different plants they eat. Every time we went into the forest and found a caterpillar, we took it home with the plant or leaf it was on. Then we feed it at home and wait to see what came out. Then we feed it at home and wait to see what came out. During their searches in the Amazon rainforest, the couple are accompanied by Robler's brother, Walter, and his cousin. In the undergrowth, they discover a caterpillar they've never seen before. Robler's brother turns their attention to another interesting find. Die Pflanze kenne ich, also die haben wir einige Bäume, weil es sind Früchte drauf für die Affen, aber ich habe nicht gewusst, dass da Schmetterlinge Eier drauflegen. Also ich weiß jetzt nicht, was draus wird, aber wir werden sie jetzt weiter füttern, wir haben die Pflanze bei uns zu Hause. Gudrun und Robler campaign to preserve butterflies in other ways too. They do educational work in the schools of Iquitos to teach young children about the importance of protecting butterflies. At the present time, they are the only butterfly breeders in the entire Amazon region. Every year, they release a certain percentage of the captive bred butterflies into the wild. Von denen zum Beispiel lassen wir mehr als 50 Prozent frei. Von den schönen großen Blauen vielleicht 10 Prozent. Wir haben heute auch am liebsten drinnen, weil es die Lieblinge der Besucher sind. Aber nachdem wir von Anfang an die Futterpflanzen außerhalb auf unserem Land gesetzt haben, hat es einen Sinn, dass wir welche freilassen. From now on, the butterflies will have to fend for themselves. 
A tower controller at an airport is the person who controls the takeoffs and landings. All the aircraft have to be coordinated and navigated, which is no easy task. But what's the link between flight navigation and butterflies? In the early days of aviation, the pioneer pilots used landmarks to navigate. Church spires, a river, or when all else failed, even a railway station sign. Today, the pilot finds support from electronics, a compass and GPS to navigate to his destination. For migrating birds, though, finding their way doesn't seem to present a problem. A trip 8,000 kilometers south and then back again is child's play for a stork. Migrating birds can do this because they were taught by their parents. But there are also butterflies who can do this. The monarch butterfly, for example. Although they don't fly quite as far as the stork, they do manage 4,000 kilometers from Canada to Mexico. It's a bit silly, really, as they only do it once, then they die. No chance to learn anything. So the monarchs possess a remarkable navigation system in their head, a clock and magnetite. They use the clock to track the sun, enabling them to always fly south. If the sun's behind the clouds, then the magnetite takes over as compass. Pretty impressive, but not quite suitable for our air transport, as always flying south won't get us home. A rush hour in the skies above Frankfurt. Aircraft take off and land every minute. And now that the new runway is finished, this is set to increase. There's only time for brief instructions via radio. Our tower controllers and pilots are perfectly coordinated, but they're constantly performing at their limits. Everything has to run like clockwork to avoid congestion in the air. Approaching Germany's biggest airport in a light aircraft is quite an adventure, but Arnim Stief has to do just that today. He delivers single-engine propeller planes from American manufacturers to customers in Germany. He's crossed the Atlantic more than 40 times and has total command of his aircraft. But even he is slightly daunted by the busy airspace over Frankfurt's Rhein-Main airport. Man muss sich integrieren in den Gesamtverkehr. Man will natürlich auf gar keinen Fall irgendwie unangenehm auffallen. Und man sieht, wenn man dort in den Funk hineingeht, wenn man die Anflugverfahren sieht, dass alles sehr, sehr schnell hintereinander abgewickelt wird. Fehler werden dort nur ganz schwer verziehen. Steve has flown around the world in 80 days in a single-engine Cirrus plane. Thanks to modern technology, this is no problem for the experienced flight instructor. But today, he'll have to rely completely on the air traffic controllers on the ground. The headquarters of German Air Traffic Security in Langen, 10 kilometers away from Frankfurt Airport. Before they can enter the control center, the flight controllers have to identify themselves and pass through a series of security gates. This is where the air traffic at Frankfurt Airport is coordinated. In an otherwise highly technological world, the decision-making here is carried out exclusively by people. The flight controllers track all the flight paths on the radar screen and give precise altitude and direction instructions to pilots landing or taking off. Absolute concentration is required when the skies are teeming with aircraft. Every dot on the screen represents hundreds of human lives. Working here, you're aware of the responsibility you have, but you don't think about the worst case scenario the whole time, the two planes could pass by too close, or that they could even crash. But we don't approach the whole thing like a video game either. We're always aware of our responsibility. Pilots of light aircraft usually navigate by sight and are themselves responsible for ensuring that they don't cross the flight paths of other planes. But when they approach bigger airports, they have to report to the control center like large aircraft and follow the flight controller's instructions. The language used is English, but with a few special rules. Für den Außenstehenden klingt unser Englisch manchmal vielleicht etwas komisch, aber es sind gewisse Sonderphrasen drin, die wir einfach brauchen, weil viele verschiedene Kulturen und Länder aufeinandertreffen im Sprechfunk und auch das Niveau an Englisch sehr unterschiedlich ist. Um ein einfaches Beispiel zu nennen, wir sagen nicht three mit th, sondern wir sagen tree, weil dieses th im Funk ein Rauschen ergibt oder auch neiner anstatt nein, um einfach eine Verwechslung mit unserem deutschen nein auszuschließen. 
There are invisible highways in the sky. The aircraft travel through a matrix of corridors like cars on a motorway. There are separate corridors reserved for private light aircraft, out of the way of larger and faster jets. Their paths only cross on the approach to larger airports. In addition to this, airspace is divided into sectors which are monitored by flight controllers in different control centers. This requires pilots to report every time they change sectors. They establish contact with the new sector controller and then their plane appears on the radar screen with its identification. Flight controllers have to monitor up to 12 aircraft at a time, directing them to the right flight lane. The flight number, altitude and speed are registered on a control panel and the flight controller draws up a landing order for the planes approaching Frankfurt. So far, the flight controllers at the Langen Control Center have safely directed Arnim Stief to Frankfurt Airport. But even veteran pilots experience an adrenaline rush during rush hour in the skies. At the airport itself, tower controllers take command of all the takeoffs and landings. This is the moment when Arnim Stief has to be fully focused on the task at hand. Now he has to act quickly so that the runway is clearing. Behind Stief, the next planes are already approaching, and they're a lot faster than him. He's made it. Now the tower crew directs him through the maze of taxiways. Like a dwarf among giants, Stief maneuvers the small Cirrus plane safely to the gate. What a relief! In the polar region, the night sky is often brightly illuminated, the northern lights. But what causes these fascinating lights? And what do they have to do with flight navigation? The northern lights are an impressive sight. They simply appear in the night skies of the polar regions. Swirling curtains of light, green, red, or even violet. Their spell has always been to people. For thousands of years, nobody could explain where they came from. And so this phenomenon, like so many others, must have come from the gods. The Vikings believed it must have been the reflection from the armor of the heroes who sat at Odin's table. Others believed that the northern lights were an omen of impending doom. Could be, could be, but today we know that it's the sun that's responsible for the eerie skies. Every now and again it shoots charged particles out into space. When these hit the Earth, they're intercepted and follow the Earth's magnetic like lines of force to the north and south poles. These concentrated particles excite the oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere, causing them to illuminate. But for many expense account jet setters, the northern lights are indeed an open view. Northern lights interfere with aircraft navigation systems. Intercontinental flights have to keep well clear during intensely active spells, meaning the flight takes longer. For Odin at his table, together with his heroes, he probably couldn't care less if the earthly soldiers of business have to cancel a super important meeting. A fascinating natural spectacle in the northern skies. It's long been known that the northern lights are caused by particle collisions several hundred kilometers up in the sky. The typical blue or violet lights are the result of the ionization of nitrogen atoms. A green, or more rarely, red light is caused by oxygen atoms. Sometimes the aurora resembles arches and ribbons, other times veils and rays of light. Those who've seen this natural wonder will never forget it. Particles that are released due to solar eruptions enter the Earth's atmosphere, creating patterns of light. Professor Brecker is a scientist who has devoted himself to this natural phenomenon. For decades, the physicist has been the director of the renowned Center for Northern Light Research in Tromso. It's hoped that the huge IceCat radar array will deliver even more revealing data on the Aurora Borealis. The cosmic processes that cause the lights in the sky occur during the daytime too, though they're invisible to the human eye. But they don't escape the artificial eyes of science. 
there are some fundamental processes we, be, we believe that takes place in the upper atmosphere when you have the aurora and that are we call it filamentary currents so the upper polar atmosphere is the closest natural laboratory you have what happens between the sun and the earth's magnetic field is also a phenomenon that is pretty universal so what we can learn from these these studies can be brought out to the universe to other planets and solar systems here on Earth, the northern lights can disrupt sensitive systems such as GPS. Perhaps their appearance is even connected to climate change. But even for experienced scientists such as Professor Brecker, they remain one of the world's great natural wonders. The Andoya rocket range in Norway sends balloons and fires rockets into the atmosphere for scientific purposes. They collect data at the same altitude as where the northern lights are formed. Space probes from the American and European space agencies are directly exposed to the solar winds. Scientists are trying to find out which particles and how many bombard the Earth and to establish how fast and how dangerous they are. These measurements in space reveal when the sun is going through a particularly active period and when the northern lights are particularly prominent as a result. The Kiel Henriksen Observatory has just come into operation. It's the most modern aurora institute in the world. Dozens of eyes are directed at the northern skies there, and the radar dishes are connected to the same network as those in Tromsø. The director of the research station in Spitsbergen is Professor Fred Segernes. Located just 1,000 kilometers from the North Pole, the scientists are well equipped for the conditions. Spitsbergen lies in a narrow band of the polar circle, the so-called auroral oval. The aurora borealis is particularly common and intense in this northerly region. In the dark winter months, the northern lights can even be seen at midday with the naked eye. This is an ideal location for specialists, but also a major challenge. As they record the currents in the sky, they discover processes of vast dimensions. When we have a lot of energy coming into this magnetic cleft, then it heats up the atmosphere, and the atmosphere rises, and, start, and, and, and uh, oxygen is starting to spin out. It is thrown out far into space. The aurora borealis is without question one of the most beautiful visual spectacles in the universe. 